All right, I think we made it, and I think it's Friday. Oof. We'll get there. 30 minutes away from the opening bell in Hong Kong, in Shanghai, in Shenzhen. You're watching The China Show. I'm David Ingles with Yvonne Mann. Our top stories this morning, stocks in Asia edge higher, following a tech-driven rally on Wall Street. The Hang Seng Index on track for a third week of gains, testing those 2024 highs. President Biden declares the U.S. commitment to defending Japan and the Philippines is ironclad as concerns grow about China's actions in disputed waters. And a Bloomberg scoop, Apple said to be preparing to overhaul its entire Mac line with AI focused in-house processors. All right, certainly see a little bit of relief after, of course, yesterday and the risk-off moves that we saw post-U.S. CPI. The PPI prices didn't move the needle as much, although you still saw a bit of roiling in that uh, bond market in the U.S., where we did see that U.S. two-year yield briefly touch that 5% handle, we're at around, just around 4.93 here this morning in the Asia sessions. So that's giving stocks at least a little bit of a lift here this morning. We talked about how the tech stocks really helped kind of buffet some of the concerns that we saw just 24 hours ago. So certainly we're watching very close closely the tech space here in Asia. We're not quite seeing that in the Kospi, though, of course, with VOK just came in setting pat when it comes to rates. Singapore as well, the MAS, didn't do much when it comes to policy as well. But the, the, the ECB is one to watch, right? What we heard from Madame Lagarde and the clearest signal yet that perhaps the central bank may be ready for that June hike, in, uh, June cut, I should say, coming. So 107.26 for euro dollar here right now. We're, we're 153 territory for dollar yen. We heard from Suzuki-san once again, it's basically the same sort of lingo uh, when it comes to how they're watching some of these excessive moves. They're not ruling out any options here at the moment. So that's not really, you're still seeing some strength, but still at 153. And gold continues to be the outperformer. Look, futures are up 1% or more here this morning, Dave. We just broke above that 2400 level. U.S. futures are flat, and we're watching very closely some of these commodities as well. Brent's still at 90 bucks. Iron ore just above that 107 level in Singapore. In terms of the setup for China here today, of course, we're still coming down to those trade numbers, which could be coming out a little bit later on than usual, I think in the more so in the afternoon than the morning here today. We're, we're hoping to see maybe continue good numbers, uh, but then again, the headline numbers might look a little bit weaker just given the year-on-year -year comparisons. But A50 futures are looking like this right now. We're slightly to the downside here. 228 for your Chinese 10-year yield and 725.61 for dollar China this morning. Dave. Yeah, uh, so we're looking at the fix coming out today and certainly given the strategy from policymakers to stabilize the currency that's, that's opening up just really almost a generational gap between forward points, CNH and NDF. We can get to the, into the weeds of that a bit later on in the show. Um, as Yvonne is pointing out, why is gold doing that? Anyway, we have a perfect guest coming through in the next hour of the China show. Suki Cooper joins us to talk us through her targets in gold and whether or not you should bet the house on this and everything you own. Um, uh, let's have a look at where we are. Losing streak on the CSI 300. I think we're now six days there. Uh, turnover has been rolling over. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, in a week where the dollars hit its highest level of the year, yields are highest level since November, HIBOR has actually come down in Hong Kong. Um, we talked about this record forward gap, and of course we are in the window, speaking of trade numbers coming through, we are also in the window for credit numbers to come out, could come out any time between now and the next few days or so. There yeah. we go. For more to wrap up the week that we've had, let's bring in Mary Nicola, our online strategist, joining us out of Singapore this morning. And, and Mary, it seems like we're seeing a, a little bit more risk put on the table here from investors, but certainly this week of central banks has been quite dominating the narrative. What's your overall sort of take from this week. Yeah, the, the main thing here is about the divergence between the ECB and the, and the Fed and the continued uh, reinforcement that the Fed is going to stay on hold, that they're not going to be in a rush. But then you've got the dichotomy of the ECB, who some members were actually looking for uh, a cut as soon as this month, and now they're more focused on June. So that pressure and that divergence in policy is going to be one of the key themes that's going to weigh on euro dollar. And we are going to see that the dollar continues to, to, to gain momentum, especially when you see the two-year yields reaching, nearing that 5%. That 
constant drift higher in uh, in the short end in the U.S. is going to continue to keep the dollar very well supported in the near term. And then on the other hand, you've got equities, and equities seem to slight what's going on in in in, in yields and continue to drive higher. But really, the test for equities is going to be earnings season, which kick off this um, as soon as uh, next week, and really to gain momentum. And that's where you're going to see if there's a true fundamental support for equities. Yeah, absolutely. I think you, you, you hit the nail on the head there, Mary, because certainly um, and I'm just going to use the, your dollar reference to get this line out. The ringgit is down as much as 0.6 percent, biggest drop since Feb. <clears throat> the BOKs on PATS, um, we're also getting some, <clears throat> excuse me, some lines coming through out of, out of Singapore. Do you think <clears throat> this dollar outperformance keeps that narrative of you as exceptionalism intact for now, equities uh, or, or currency markets? Uh, absolutely. And the data had reinforced it. So whether you looked at the labor market data, um, whether you looked at ISM, and then of course next week we have retail sales. So you've got a string of U.S. data that really highlights this U.S. exceptionalism. Now add to that if earnings comes in and you see strong guidance from companies and you see outperformance on the earnings side as well. So that exceptionalism in the U.S. is going to continue to support the dollar, not to mention the fact that you still have um, the other other countries, let's say, take for example the Eurozone, and the Eurozone is showing um, continued weakness in growth. Uh, one of the reasons why you've, you're hearing uh, a, a louder chorus from ECB, ECB members to cut is really to support growth, where we've had very, very lackluster growth over the last year. And that re and obviously overly restrictive territory is weighing on growth in the Eurozone, prompting them to want to see um, a rate cut sooner rather than later. Uh, and, and of course, that, that just leaves FX still quite vulnerable in this part of the world. And, and we're watching very closely this B. I mean, what, what could be the driving forces for the B in the next three to six months? Yeah, it, it looks like there's two opposing forces really dragging on the on the CNY. So obviously you have dollar strength um, and obviously broad dollar strength that's really weighing on Asian currencies and, 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 and including the CNY. But then you've got policymakers who are really drawing a line, line in the sand on that 710 level for the fixing. Um, so these two opposing forces are, are really conf conflicting for the CNY. But there's if you look at it, there's no real fundamental reason for the CNY. CNY to rally. Um, if you look at, at economic data, whatever is, is coming through is not showing that there is strength in the, in the China economy or, or there's a revival um, of strength in the China economy. So next week is going to be absolutely critical with the deluge of data coming out from China, whether it's retail sales, GDP, confirming whether there is any fundamental support for uh, the strength in the currency. But that looks so far to be unlikely. We'll see. Yeah, Mary, thank you so much. Mary Nicola laying out for us, even as we look ahead to next week, medium term lending facility, one year lending rate, uh, trade numbers coming through. And if, you know, the PMI numbers were largely on point, we should be getting maybe some decent numbers yeah. uh, coming out next week. Anyway, we can, there's a weekend in between, so we can think about that uh, come Monday. Uh, let's bring in our guest this hour, uh, Stephen Sun, head of research at HSBC Chen. Hi, he's with us here on set. It's very nice to see. You. It's been a while. Um, it's busy week for HSBC, of course. <laughs> we had the, the Global Investment Summit. How busy were you? How many meetings did you have this week? Uh, I probably got 20 meetings. In yeah. the meantime, I want to take the opportunity to thank both of you for helping out at our first, you oh, know, GIS. Don't mention it. it was yeah. fun, yeah. <laughs> okay, what's the sense on China? <laughs> um, I think it's fair to say that uh, the over 3,000 guests attended the GIS came away from the conference uh, less negative or marginally more positive. Mm. Uh, I think this is also consistent with uh, my global marketing takeaway, meeting with uh, uh, 100 global institutions. Uh, the reason is because uh, if you look at the funds inflow, right, um, the outflow has essentially stopped. And then uh, from uh, end of February, for the first time, we're seeing foreign not only money coming in through the Stock Connect, investing in Asia market. Um, 
I would say that's more driven by tactical considerations, i.e., the Chinese equities are you know very cheap, and in the meantime, the performance for Chinese equity space started to improve, entering into the year of dragon. So for those tactical reasons, majority of the clients who are still significantly underweight in China, they're thinking to um, partially close the underweight. How do you look at amongst the the clients that you that are from all over the world? Right, it seems like the closer you get to China, people are. A little bit always more positive. What about the, the U.S. domicile funds, the U.K. Uh -huh. funds? Are, are they warming up as well? Um, I actually would say the opposite. Okay. I.e., the domestic investors is probably even more pessimistic than offshore investors. The reason is because if you look at the performance of different indices, in indices, the ADR index in the U.S. and also the Hang Seng Tech index in uh, here have performed slightly better than the CSI 300, CSI 500. Um, but there are differences, right? You know, in terms of the different type of investors, I would say the EM managers is probably uh, more positive on China because the comparison between China and India, which has been uh, the best performing mar EM market price to perfection, the valuation gap is huge. So more and more EM managers started to notice the valuation gap. And then this is followed by global value investors. And then again here, uh, the consideration is relative value, right? China, internet versus, you know, Magnificent Seven. Um, so for value investors, uh, they are definitely taking actions. Right. And you mentioned tactical still uh, is, is, the, is the main strategy, or do you feel that there's some of the structural funds are coming in uh, for a longer period of time and hopefully staying in this market? Um, I think that will still take time, right? Okay. You know, fundamentally, I think um, uh, global investors are still concerned about uh, the insufficient domestic demand in China, um, which is, you know, precisely why I think yes, only as late as yesterday, the NDRC officials talking about how this trade-in replacement subsidy program uh, for consumer goods, mm -hmm. including auto, including household appliance and uh, home furnishings, could be re released in the coming days. So China definitely need, would lead that kind of demand side measures uh, in order to uh, sustain market rally and uh, make you know, global investors you know, less concerned uh, structurally and also from a medium to long term perspective. Mm. So we, we're seeing a, some of, a bit of a rally in, in, in China this year. I mean, what, what is going to drive this ne next leg up? What factors do you need, still need to see? Okay, yeah. Um, the next leg up could be driven by you know, both regulatory development vis-a-vis uh, -vis, you know, how they're trying to um, um, uh, reinvigorate capital market. Uh, and I would say on that front, China, Korea, Japan regulators, they're doing similar things. Mm -hmm. uh, in South Korea, it's called the Value Up Program, right? And then in Japan, they started working on corporate governance like three years ago. In China's case, um, you know, since the uh, CSRC new chairman uh, took over, he talked about how, you know, tighten up IPO quality, how companies should pay more dividend, and in the meantime, do more share buybacks. More importantly, you know, cancellation of the, those shares bought back. Uh, this could help to address one of the key issues, chronic issues in the A-share market, i.e. excessive equity offering, and as a result of that, you know, equity dilution. Um, the second uh, but on, secondly, I think it's also fundamental, right? It has to boil down to uh, better economic data, uh, has to be boiled down to upward earnings revision. Mm. All right, we'll have more with Stephen Shun there. Mm. Coming up, head of research at HSBC, Chen Hai. Still ahead, Apple is said to be gearing up to overhaul its entire Mac lineup with its AI-focused in-house chips. We have details on that Bloomberg scoop. Coming up, we're also counting down the open of trade in Shanghai, Shenzhen, and Hong Kong. Futures were slightly on the back foot here this morning on Friday, but we are set for a third straight week of gains for the Hang Seng Index. This is The China Show. Happy Friday. Your RMB fix just crossing the Bloomberg here this morning, and as Dave just mentioned in the break, it's frozen at 709.67. Yeah. What are they going to let it go? <laughs> ah.
<laughs> heard what you did there. All right, 725.50 for your offshore rate here this morning. And we're focusing a little bit more on the geopolitics this morning. Yeah, the, a big meeting trilat these last few hours or so. Certainly a lot of headlines coming through out of Washington. So you have the U.S., you have Japan, and you have the Philippines saying that they are committed to a free and open Indo-Pacific. Now the statement comes after the summit between the three, uh, the leaders of the three countries following increasingly assertive Chinese actions in disputed waters. United States defense commitments to Japan and to the Philippines are ironclad. They're ironclad. As I said before, any attack on Philippine aircraft, vessels, or armed forces in the South China Sea would invoke our mutual defense treaty. Facing the complex challenges of our time requires concer concerted efforts on everyone's part, a dedication to a common purpose, and an unwavering commitment to the rules-based international order. China's current external stance and military actions present unprecedented and the greatest strategic challenge, not only to the peace and security of Japan, but to the peace and stability of international community at large. For more, let's bring in our chief North Asia correspondent, Stephen Engel. Uh, you heard it from the president, ironclad. Yep. How important was it at, to come out of this meeting to show this united front against China? I, I think this is an important development. I'm not saying it's necessarily going to lead up to a buildup of U.S. troops in the Philippines. Believe me, I've heard sources in Washington talk about that. Some people within the Pentagon mm -hmm. would like to see an increase of military presence permanent, on a permanent basis in the Philippines to fill that gap between, of course, U.S. troops that are permanently based in Korea, in Japan, and then in Guam, further off in the Pacific. There's a gap there. The Philippines and Palawan uh, is closest to the Spratly Islands and the South China Sea. We do know, of course, that Subic Bay was closed down in 1992, but since 2015, 2016, the U.S. military, U.S. Navy has been using Subic Bay, the deep water port, as a resupply port, as well as when there are war games or exercises in the South China Sea. Uh, as recently, these three nations, as well as Australia, had exercises uh, last week in the South China Sea. So, you know, I think that is the concern perhaps by China and others that there is a, a precursor here for a buildup of U.S. troops or military presence in the Philippines. I'm getting way ahead of myself, but that is the kind of the takeaway that this trilateral meeting has focused so much on the security threat in that part of the world. And have we heard from Beijing? We, we have through Global Times and you know state media. Uh, we do have a full screen graphic where we can bring that up. But basically, uh, state media as a mouthpiece, uh, the Global Times, beneath the active pursuit of cooperation, peace, and security, says the Global Times in an editorial, an undercurrent of confrontation, danger, and conflict flows. Interestingly as well, the Global Times today published an article, an exclusive interview they say was with the former Philippines President Rodrigo Duterte uh, saying, uh, you know, be careful, Manila, under Marcos, getting too close to the United States. The U.S. will not die for us. So it's, it's interesting. There's, it's a lot of rhetoric right now. But with the U.S., Philippines, and Japan showing a united front, bringing the Philippines into what's already been a united front we've seen with South Korea, uh, Japan, and the United States, now the Philippines as well, of course, with the South China Sea being such a flashpoint right now. Stephen Engel, flashpoint. thank you so much. Stephen Engel, our chief North Asia correspondent. They're wrapping up the trilats uh, that took place a couple of hours back. Let's talk about markets and pivot back there and really look at maybe, does, is this in any way something to consider? Is this affecting the commercial interest for some Chinese companies? as you look at this sort of bifurcated world. Uh, Stephen Sun is still with us, head of research at HSBC Chenhai. Not to get into the, the weeds of geopolitics, but certainly when you have two big economic superpowers raising barriers to each other's markets, are you seeing that show up as far as earnings and earnings forecasts are concerned? Yeah, certainly. I think that's uh, one of the key investors' concern, uh, geopolitics. Um, but hopefully, you know, all these negatives are already in the price, reflected in the highly you know, de depressed valuation. Um, in terms of earnings, um, I think what matters more is how China is going to stimulate domestic demand, uh, which is actually the root of this, you know, geopolitical tension, if you will. Uh, China accounts for over 30% of a global manufacturing market share. 
But if you look at the global market share of consumption, China only accounts for 15%. Mm. So this boils down how they should stimulate domestic demand, and hopefully with that kind of development, this could alleviate geopolitical tension, trade-related dispute as well. And then that's very important to look at um, you know, the trade-in, replacement subsidy, the equipment renewal programs, yeah. they talked about at the two sessions. Now we're starting to see more details. Uh, firstly, on the equipment renewal, the PBOC has committed half trillion RMB credit support to that you know, program. And in the meantime, for the trade-in and also um, uh, replacement subsidy, uh, it could be substantial, right? Uh, because any stimulus in terms of impact through the multiplier effect has to reach trillion, right, in yeah. order to be million for, for the economy. Uh, and um, I think the details should be released by the Minister of Commerce very soon. All right, Stephen, we'll have more from him. Stephen Sun there, uh, head of research at HSBC Chennai, really focusing on, of course, that consumption upgrade. Uh, you take a look at how futures are looking like. We're, we're still in negative territory, I believe, when it comes to the XUA here today. There you go. We're down oh, yeah. about 7 tenths of 1 percent of the Hang Seng as well. So could be continuing to the clients that we saw on Thursday, 725.59 for your RMB. Plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. You're watching the China Show. So we're about 10 minutes from the, the Friday reference rate of the day, and certainly unchanged has been, well, I guess, the, the key strategy coming under the PBOC to really anchor the currency, or one of the ways they're anchoring the currency. And what that's done, and it's emerged this week, and we're wrapping this up, of course, since it's Friday, is a new subplot, right? It's encouraging, I guess, in some ways, because that's brought down the cost of shorting the currency. It's encouraging, I guess, in some ways, more speculators to come in. So offshore, which is freely traded mostly, um, that's your CNH forward. The gap between the two is now at a record. Let's watch that and how that evolves moving forward, because certainly as you fight the currency, the tide of the currency markets, that then creates an aberration. The other one that's come up this week very, very quickly is HIBOR rates. So despite yields picking up, HIBOR mortgages are tied to this in Hong Kong, have actually evolved for good news, of course, for borrowers, seven but low on this specific one. Bon. All right. Mm. Something to watch, of course. Uh, not quite seeing that spill over to Hybor, which is probably a good sign for us here in Hong Kong. We take a look at how this market is set up here on this Friday morning. Looks like we are poised for some declines at the open. Hang Seng down 7, 10 to 1 percent in the pre-market. The open is next. Welcome back. You're watching The China Show. We made it to Friday. It felt like a long week for me. I don't know about you guys, but certainly we made it. Uh, we're still dealing with some declines here when it comes to the pre-market in Hong Kong, so we're set for maybe two days of losses. Still, though, we're on track for a third week of gains when it comes to that benchmark. a futures have been flat here. No movement when it comes to that fix here, so certainly we continue to watch that policy support. And we have trade data coming out later on as well. Dave? Yeah, that, and we are also in the window for credit numbers coming through, right? So that's perhaps also an indication of, of the where this economy is headed, more forward-looking indicator. We're set to open lower, generally speaking, but you know the gains from from last Friday have been enough, at least as Ivana's pointing out, yeah. to nudge uh, many of the benchmarks here in Hong Kong, Hang Seng, Hang Seng China, for example, uh, to the highest just about uh, of the year, three weeks of gains. Right, um, declines at the open or weakness coming through. Let's see, 3,500. We've been stuck at about these levels uh, for the better part last three days or so. We have an auction coming out today, by the way. Uh, China, I think it's 20, my producer's about to help me out, might be coming up bottom of your screens right now. Uh, a couple of billion on deck as far as that's concerned. Shanghai crude is picking up a little bit, as with uh, iron ore prices. Now, we're looking at other things moving. Thank you so much, 2029 20, bonds. There we go. Uh, Billy Billy was a uh, big mover up, uh, a big move up yesterday in the overnight session. That should be coming up on top of your screens. There we go, I'll follow through there. Yum China outlining Joey Watt, the CEO, outlining the buyback in a dividend program uh, coming through as at least $3 billion over 2024 to 2026 was the number given. We're looking at some of the gold mining plays, gold bottom of your screens. Uh, we should be trading at 2400 last we checked. Ah, there we go, 1.3%. Thank you. Flip the page. 
Airline stocks in focus, maybe a ge geopolitical angle to this. We're looking at declines here, and we're also looking at EVs, very much in focus. Xpong has been moving all over the place this week so far. That should be coming up. Neo also uh, want to watch as well. There we go. And I'll leave you with a look at, I guess, as we wrap up the week. Offshore has done better than onshore. The turnover want to watch perhaps moving forward. Um, as the market in terms of price has sort of stagnated as well, we've started to see this taper off a little bit. That's your 15-day moving average of China stock over. Turnover, $1 trillion. We've been touching that Feb, early March. But since prices have come down, that's sort of abated a little bit. And maybe that picks up, Yvonne. Who knows? All right. Still with us is Stephen Sud, head of research at HSBC Tianhai. We talked about <clears throat> how you know, people are getting a little bit more constructive when it comes to China. How, how, do you put, how are you putting money to work? What, what are you recommending right now? Okay, investors are trying to balance between, you know, the high dividend yield stock, i.e. the value group, yeah. and uh, versus, you know, quality growth sectors, such as EV, battery, solar, uh, healthcare, consumer electronics, home appliance, so on and so forth. Uh, what's going to shift that balance is certainly, you know, the demand side stimulus measures. Uh, take this cash for clunker program as an example. Mm. There are over 300 million cars on the road in China. Right? Out of that, 11 million, they do not meet with today's emission standards. And out of that 11 million, uh, 7 million are 15 years old, i.e. they need to be scrapped. So um, if this program comes through, most likely it would be comprising of subsidy from the central government, local government, and OEM manufacturers. So three parties to contribute to that, which could be material. right? And um, we estimate um, this could swing the auto demand from a negative 2% growth to positive 3% growth if additional 1 million car mm. could be sold. Okay, so those are the areas where we, we could consider mm -hmm. adding exposure. Any areas to avoid? Um, you know, the um, uh, most likely, I think, uh, steel would be coming from um, the upstream sectors in the material space, mm. um, property, given, you know, the earnings, you know, downward revision mm. um, has been significant and it's probably not over yet. Okay. You, you mentioned it's not, you know, quality growth could be better than not just these SOEs with high dividends, but, but also the AI trade. Why? Because everyone still seems very focused on anything that's attached to AI mm -hmm. at the moment. Yes. Um, in China's case, obviously, China also wants to catch this AI train. Um, so that's why if you look at uh, the AI hardware space, software space, in hardware space, there are companies in the Asia market doing a lot of things, right? Optical transceivers, the AI-related server. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's a very quite valid investment thing uh, last year and then this year as well. Uh, the key difference this year we would say, you know, given the experience last year, once you are hitting that earnings season and then the story needs to be uh, either um, uh, rectified or proved to be false. Mm. Uh, so that's why I think investors will be more critical this time around when looking at the AI related theme in Asia market as well. Mm. How much upside, and I'm looking beyond the next six months, how much upside do you think there is in this market? Given the fact that you know revisions to earnings have yet to budge, it still remains in deflation. Property, as you mentioned, still an issue. Yes. What confidence do investors have in this market beyond three six months? Okay, so we uh, we, we think that in the next um, six to nine months, uh, we're still seeing five to uh, twelve percent of the upside, with more upside for you know gross indices. Uh, I think this is mainly to be supported by earnings growth that's going to come in through uh, this year. So remind you that the uh, majority of the companies have reported their earnings so far for 2023. We're probably talking about a flattish or slightly down scenario for last year. So this year, most of the consensus would have put earnings uh, for a share market around 15%, uh, which is quite reasonable. You know, if you average out to the two years, 2023 and 2024, it's roughly 7 to 8%, which is similar to uh, nominal GDP growth or in line with uh, you know, growth of money supply. Mm. How, we always talk about how, how much the Fed really does influence Chinese markets. I mean, I'm just wondering, given what the currency is doing here right now, there's, a lot that, there's not a whole lot that the PBOC can do to really arrest these declines right now. How, how do you think that impacts overall 
risk sentiment in the equity uh -huh. market. And appetite, yeah, from yes. dollar investors too. Uh huh. Yeah, so certainly. I think you know the timing of Fed rate cut has been continuing to be pushed upon towards the end of the year, and the magnitude has been cut again and again. Um, this is, in general, not positive for EM in terms of funds uh, inflow. Mm -hmm. And uh, specifically, our Asian strategist, Harold, has been talking about a potential rotation out of Japan to China. But that's depending on when the Fed is going to cut, and together with that, when the yen will start to appreciate, you know, against the U.S. dollar. So this is how the Fed could actually affect, you know, capital inflow uh, into the China market. Yeah. Okay. Um, one of the other things that's come up, um, I think it was Morgan Stanley and the team of Laura Wang and Jonathan Garner that keep bringing this up. And <clears throat> reason why they remain cautious on this market mm -hmm. is when you look longer term at China, you know, return on equity has been just nowhere to be found. And I'm wondering how one gets over that yeah. hurdle uh, and looks at this market as cheap, because it's cheap for a reason, but is it cheap that could yeah. get more expensive in a sustainable way when return on equity, as we were pointing out, has just been trending lower? Yeah. Uh, certainly. I think, you know, a lot of the investors, they share with this concern, mm -hmm. i.e. in the medium to long term, they're still looking for more structural reforms in order to uh, sustain the market rebound. Um, chief among them is still how do you increase income for Chinese household, right? right? I talked about this 30% of the global manufacturing market share versus 15% consumption. consumption. Mm -hmm. uh, this is owing to the fact that uh, income growth for Chinese household has significantly decelerated post-pandemic, mm -hmm. right? If you take a longer time horizon for the past 15 years, China's GDP has actually quadrupled. But during the same period, if you look at the minimum wage growth in China, it has only doubled, i.e. the income growth has yet to catch up with GDP growth. So to reverse these kinds of you know, structural issues, you would need structural reforms relating to how better slice the, you know, the pie of the GDP among household, government, and also capital. This also requires you know, to redefine the role of the government, right? the, the so-called fiscal reform. And this will also relate to um, household registration reform. How do you incorporate the 200 and 300 migrant workers uh, for them to fully settle in the cities they're living in? and also building a social safety net, so on and so forth. All of this would need a, um, uh, a roadmap to be laid out at events like, you know, the third plan that every single one has been so anxiously waiting for. That's right. And very quickly as a follow, suffice to say, <clears throat> can we be confident in the ability of policymakers to see those reforms? Through? Because it seems that this will take a, a lot of time. Yes, um, I think the answer is uh, in a short, short, it's, it, short answer is yes. Mm -hmm. uh, although I think uh, policy, you know, correction or self-correction mm -hmm. generally takes much longer time than what investors would like to see. Mm -hmm. um, but eventually, I think uh, it will still happen. Mm -hmm. It's uh, not a question of if, but just when. Fantastic, Stephen. It was great to see you. Let's yeah. do this again sooner. Uh, uh, Stephen Sun, the head of research at HSBC uh, Shanghai. Wow. You were talk 40 minutes there <laughs> on Chinese markets. Lots to digest and we barely scratched the surface. I was saying, he can narrate e-books, yeah. that voice. <laughs> there we go. Cool. Um, I think we have some things coming through out of Korea. Yeah, some interesting lines coming through in that statement here right now. And we're about to get into this presser at, at the top of the hour. But the BOK tweaking the language when it comes to keeping that restrictive stance for a sufficient period. Now, previously it was sufficiently long period. That's why you're seeing that weakness in the wand here this morning. So it looks like they're leaning a little bit more on the dovish side, which is quite surprising because given where we've seen when it comes to inflation picking up yeah. in this economy again, the tech cycle has turned more favorable. So the economy is actually looking pretty good. And we also have a lot of change within the, their, their committee as well. Yeah, because that, that's important because coming up in the next hour is actually the press briefing. So they'll unpack this. So they've kept rates unchanged. They've kept rates unchanged since January of last year. It was only in the meeting before today's meeting where we did get a vote split. If you ask economists, the latest survey, this is as of late Feb, is that that rate cut comes 
second half, third quarter, fourth quarter of next year. So maybe a little bit more meat on that specific bone. Uh, turn to your Bloomberg, by the way, for more on this TLIV Go commentary analysis on this Bank of Korea rate decision. Plenty more ahead. You are watching The China Show. Happy Friday. Well, Apple shares climbed in New York after a Bloomberg scoop revealing the company is prepared to overhaul its entire Mac lineup with AI-focused in-house chips. We're also watching some of these Apple suppliers here in the region. Still a mixed bag here this morning. Let's bring in our Asia Tech executive editor, Peter Elstrom, to walk us through this story. So tell us a bit more what we know so far. So we're getting new Macs. Uh, I hope everybody's excited about that. Yeah, this is actually a pretty quick refresh for Apple. Usually they take a little bit longer, but they have been struggling a bit with the growth in their computer products. Uh, Macs in particular have been a little bit slow, a little bit sluggish. iPhone, of course, has been the star for so many years that's gotten a lot of attention. And now what we're seeing is this pretty quick refresh of the Mac lineup, as you say, the full lineup of Macs with an M4 chip that's going to have AI capabilities. Of course, AI is the hottest technology out there, and they're hoping that with this new chip, they'll be able to tempt uh, buyers to be able to come back and start buying new Macs, both the laptops and the desktop uh, computers that they've had. It's been a bit of an issue because in the last fiscal year, demand for Macs fell about 27 percent. Right. Usually it's been kind of a bright spot for them, but that was a problem. They tried refreshing with new chips, the M3 chips, last year in October. That didn't really revive demand, so they're trying again with these M4 chips, which again are going to have more AI cap capabilities. They're hoping to tap in into this demand for AI uh, services across the board and see if that lifts sales a little bit more than some of these past efforts. Yeah, because the, to your point, the lineup with the M3 chips, this, these are just five-month-old products, if I'm not mistaken. So do we have a timetable of when this new lineup is then going to yeah, hit the shelves? they're planning on, according to what sources have been telling our, our reporter, uh, they're planning on introducing the new lineup of M4 chips later on this year. So it is a quite... Uh, a quite quick refresh for the brands. They're going to have three different models of the M4 uh, computers that are going to be out there. Uh, low end, uh, 14 inch, uh, uh, a higher end, 14 inch, and then a 16 inch also. Mm -hmm. So they think that that's going to be able to tempt buyers back into the market. The trouble, of course, is that once consumers hear that these new computers are coming with new chips, right. then they stop buying the existing laptop. So yeah. it may hurt a little bit the demand at this point, but they hope that it's going to revive it going forward. Right. Yeah. As long as I, I would imagine it's within the fiscal year. Peter, thank you so much. <laughs> uh, Peter Elstrom, there, our Asia Tech Executive Editor, of course, here with us in our Hong Kong studios. Now, investors, speaking of, and we almost brushed on earnings there, speaking of earnings, the first quarter earnings are coming up. Uh, earnings season and major U.S. As banks are kicking things off, JP, Citi, Wells Fargo, all reporting later Friday. Uh, our colleague Shanali Basak has more on what specifically to watch, starting with net interest income. At the end of last year, Wall Street players took turns predicting a slowdown after a record haul of more than $250 billion on expectations that the Fed would start cutting interest rates. But three months later, that hasn't happened. In fact, economists are reducing the amount of expected rate cuts. So when it comes to net interest income, J.P. Morgan is set to win big, partly because of its size compared to peers. Expect earnings of about $23 billion in the first quarter. That's almost seven times more more than the industry estimated average. Investment banking has benefited from strength in U.S. equities, debt issuance, and deal making. And again, J.P. Morgan has the edge with a projected $1.8 billion in fee revenue, up 10% from a year before. Punching above its weight, though, is Bank of America, a rival which is likely to report $1.3 billion from investment banking, up 14% from a year ago. And finally, we'll want to hear any updates about how big banks plan to counter exposure to commercial real estate problems. Wells Fargo is the one to watch here, as its share of CRE lending is the highest versus its largest peers. Bloomberg Intelligence says a 2% write-down to CRE loans would reduce Wells Fargo's 2024 earnings per share by about 13% before accounting for reserves that have already been set aside. I'm Shanali Basak for Bloomberg News.
So that's the earnings preview there. Meanwhile, we're tracking what's been going on with Morgan Stanley. So we saw the shares fall the most in five months uh, in the U.S. session after a report that U.S. regulators are examining its money laundering controls. That's according to the Wall Street Journal. The SEC is among those looking into the bank. Let's bring in our finance and investing editor, Patrick Winters. He's with us here this morning on this story. Patrick, how bad is this for Morgan Stanley? Well, yeah, I mean, this appears to have begun at some point last year, but has now broadened to include other government agencies, according to the Wall Street Journal. And, uh, of course, it's pretty bad for Morgan Stanley because wealth is one of their biggest businesses. So Morgan Stanley and UBS several years ago uh, pinned uh, their whole kind of business model around wealth management, the stable revenues which you get from managing money for rich people. And that can kind of offset some of the, uh, you know, uh, really good revenues you can get from investment banking, but also some of those surprise losses. So I think that's kind of one of the reasons why the shares have been dropping. And Patrick, maybe just put this into context for us. How common or, or otherwise are, are these investigations in, in, into the wealth units? I think they happen pretty often. Um, if you look back, mm. not specifically this kind of investigation, which appears to be about um, clients which are outside the US, but if you look back to UBS, uh, that's one example. They had this big probe into um, helping French clients evade taxes. They tried to fight it for years and years and years. I think they were fined $5 billion. It was a pretty bad um, uh, thing for them. And then uh, Deutsche Bank also had some issues in the, the US and Credit Suisse. Uh, you know, before it was acquired by UBS, if you looked at the litigation report, it was gigantic and it was like reading War and Peace. So they had their own issues. So all <laughs> banks have these issues. Um, and I think Morgan Stanley is definitely not the only one, uh, but it's not the kind of thing which a wealth manager wants. It's, it's built around stability. You know, it wants to be not the Goldman Sachs. It wants to be the stable bank. So if you then have a big probe, that kind of cuts into what the, bus uh, the business model is supposed to be. Patrick, thank you. Patrick Winners, our finance and investing editor in Singapore for us. Uh, some other corporate stories we're tracking at this point. The largest U.S. airlines are asking the White House, the Biden administration here, to block new flights for Chinese carriers citing what they call Beijing's anti-competitive policies. The Airlines for America trade group and several unions have made the plea in a letter to the secretaries of state and transportation. Now, flights between the U.S. and China are growing but remain well below the average 340 per week. That was the rate pre-pandemic. Now, U.S. federal agencies have been ordered to analyze emails, reset credentials and secure Microsoft cloud accounts over concerns about possible Russian hacking. The directive was issued earlier this month by the U.S. Uh, Cybersecurity Agency and made public on Thursday. The agency accuses a Russia state-sponsored group called Midnight Blizzard of trying to compromise some Microsoft customers. Okay, good news. Maybe. Taylor Swift, her music, back on TikTok, despite an ongoing dispute between her record label and the social video platform. And the timing now coincides with the upcoming release of Swift's next album. That's due, of course, next week, in case you didn't know. Uh, Universal Music Group pulled its music from the platform back in Feb after failing to come up, uh, come to terms, rather, on a new licensing agreement. Okay, plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg. Right, so we could be getting any, well, any moment now, really. We're on watch for trade numbers coming out of China, March numbers, dollar, and also renminbi. Maybe as a way to contextualize and look ahead to this, you know, one of the leading indicators, not a comprehensive one, of course, uh, new export orders for March. This is the PMI numbers, which might actually indicate or orders further down the road and not so much for March. But in terms of trend, things have been picking up. If you base it simply on this, this specific sub-gauge, actually rose to the highest level in 12 months. Just keep that in mind as we look ahead to these trade numbers, which, as we mentioned, could come out any time. Now, right, just for a brief look at movers, we're about 23 minutes into the cash market session here. We're looking specifically at um, some of these EV plays as well, including Xiaomi, of course, which recently uh, tossed its hat in the ring here. Uh, Morgan Stanley out with a new price target for the stock, 20 bucks a pop. We're at 1660 right now. Do the math on what that implied um, the implied upside is for that. Uh, the rest, though, as you can see, some downside, mostly Xpeng and also Neo. 
uh, on the back of Ford, the price cut driving, of course, the startup sell-off. Right. Um, very quickly, are we doing Korea? Are we doing China? We can do either. We can do. Let's see what we go with. Okay, let's do Korea. Why not? Um, so weakness coming through in the currency right now. Interestingly, in case you missed it, a couple of minutes back, red headline crossing the terminal on this tweak to the statement. They removed one word. If you can spot what that word is, they removed the word long from sufficiently long to sufficient period. Um, it's not clear, by the way, from that graphic what that means in terms of, just to give you more context, and how much they need to wait for restrict, uh, the policy to remain restrictive. There we go. Okay, uh, very quickly, China's looking like this, 1.2% of the downside Hang Seng Index. We are still on track at these levels to close higher for the week, which would then take us to three straight weeks. Dollar China, some strength coming through in the currency there as well. Right, coming up here. On the China Show, we'll talk all things precious metals with Suki Cooper from Standard Chartered Gold, of course, trading at 2400 and all things cross-asset, asset allocation. Should we be concerned with inflation? We're also talking Korea with J.P. Morgan Asset. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. You're watching The China Show. Yeah, we made it. It's Friday, so before we head into a weekend of deep sleep, maybe housewarming parties, hitting the beach, hitting the bar, or whatever floats your boat, maybe a good book. We're flat across the CSI 300s, and you know what? We've been seeing losses every day this week so far. We'll see how we end. MSCI China, though, 7 tenths of 1%. That's really where you see the bulk of the gains anyway, and we're still waiting for trade numbers to come through here. Yeah, you're seeing more of the declines really in the Hang Seng market. We're down more than 1% here this morning, so it, it's debatable whether we get to that third weekly gain here today. Mm. We'll see if we get it there. But the rest of Asia is looking like this here right now, and it's it's pretty slow going. I mean, the, the, the U.S. PPI numbers didn't do as much damage as as the P CPI prices uh, on Thursday. The dollar is pretty flat, although we're still talking about the highest in, in the year. Yep, uh, when on, it comes both, to the both yeah. on both ones. On both the Bloomberg dollar index and the dollar index. Uh, and the case, at least catching a bid. Korea's on the back foot here. Some interesting lines coming through from the BOK. We're about to hear from the governor himself about how they're taking away and changing some of the language here. So instead of saying rates are sufficiently going to be staying for a long period of time, restrictive levels, they took out the long. So the market's taking that as a little bit more dovish this morning. Yeah, it's coming sooner. Maybe. Rather than longer. Or, or, <laughs> or later. Or later. They'll clarify the, the, the terms. The press briefing begins, as Iwana's pointing out, this hour as well. In the meantime, though, let's, let's see what we can dig into as far as the Chinese markets go here. Uh, joining us here on set, uh, Charlotte Yang, our Asia Equities reporter, to tell us what are you guys busy with on a quiet day like today? Yeah, today is quite quiet. You know, um, the Hong Kong market actually started falling after hitting the Henson China Enterprise Index since it's hit that 20% milestone. Yeah. It's now a second day of decline. I think the few names, the big names that was bucking the trend today is Xiaomi, mm -hmm. which uh, Morgan Stanley raised its price target um, after upbeat EV sales. I think overall sentiment um, is a bit cautious after, um, you know, the, the consumer prices and also producer prices came as a disappointment yesterday. And also, I think people are quite cautious about the export data coming out this afternoon, uh, where I think... Um, um, economist survey are showing that it's a decline for the month of March, about 1.9%. But more importantly, I think it's a data down next week as well as earnings. Yeah, yeah tell us what, what next week's going to bring, right? You talked about the GDP numbers and the like. We also have some big earnings coming up, too. Yeah, so um, next week looks like very busy with data. Um, GDP is one. Also, I think a lot of focus will be on the new home prices and used home prices. Um, as you know, the biggest um, headache right now for the market is still the property sector. Uh, but right now, those, um, uh, yeah, so that's one thing to watch. And also, we're also kicking out the first earnings seasons, even though the last one just ended. Um, yeah. So it was Monday, SATL, the Chinese battery maker, they're going to report aftermarket. And remember that they had a big jump last time. Um, so this time, everybody will be focused on how their sales and earn earnings are doing, and especially with the EV sales, um, uh, battery sales, uh, slowing expected for this year. All right. 
Charlotte, thank you. Charlotte Yang there with uh, just a quick sort of summary of what's really going on and driving these markets here today and next week. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about the renminbi because certainly mm. there's a lot of nuances that you're seeing within these markets about where things are going to go. I mean, take a look at the premium to borrow dollars in China's local markets has jumped over the past month. It's another example of the resurgent U.S. currency's global reach and persistent headwinds facing the renminbi. Let's bring in our FX and rates reporter, Tanya Chen. So, so what are people saying about this here right now? Yeah, so I think you guys have been covering it really well in the last hour, but basically oh, dollar funding costs um, are uh, are rising onshore, and that normally just that just tracks with what we're hearing out of the U.S., right? This robust economic data, these um, expectations when the Fed will cut rates are getting shifted back. And conversely, you're seeing the same in 12-month uh, 12, 12 forwards on the yuan, right? Those are dropping because they're just these expectations that the dollar is continuing to rise. What analysts are saying is that this kind of supply and demand imbalance is just really just heaping more pressure on the yuan woes. Um, the PBOC may have to kind of go back to an old tactic they used last year where they would cut the forex uh, reserve requirements at the banks. And this would basically kind of replenish dollar liquidity into the market, relieving some of that yuan depreciation pressure. Um, last time they did, did this was in September. And I think that rate is around 4% right now. Yeah. And, you know, comparing it to September, of course, the the, 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 the reference rates to the estimates are, have surpassed those levels in terms of the spreads. I think it was yesterday we did get some news that some of the state-owned banks were selling dollars yeah. at specific levels. In other words, have we, have we entered a new phase of the so-called intervention here? Yeah, I think that's a great question because um, what I want to draw you back to is this yuan reference rate, right? Like, as you said, that gap between the estimates and what they've set it is at a record. Mm -hmm. But if you think about where they've just been setting the fix kind of in the last recent weeks and months, it's still just the same level. It's mm -hmm. sub 7.1, right? Mm -hmm. And so you kind of have to take into account the fact that the gap is widening just because on the spot rate, it's, in, um, it's weakening, right? And mm -hmm. so um, it's not necessarily a very strong signal from the officials yet that they're like, you know, warning off the yuan bears, like we want to, you know, strengthen the yuan. It's nothing like that at this point. Um, and you did see state banks going back into the market um, last year and this year, but not as forcefully as last year. I think, I, I don't know if you remember this, but last year they were telling some of the um, institutions to sell right at the reference rate at the beginning of the market. So you would see them kind of like selling at the reference rate at like 7.09 and then it would just kind of weaken like, you know, several pips right after that. Um, so I think the other thing to watch for is what you were saying. Um, I I think if you see any moves from like Japan or any of the other kind of um, major developed markets, but if you see any moves from Japan, that could really trigger the PBOC to have to reassess uh, whether or not they're defending the right range. There we go. Tanya, thank you so much. Tanya Chen, our FX uh, and rates reporter there. Right. Uh, just ahead, uh, gold. What are we doing now in price? 2400 2, Yeah. There we go. 2410 What's going on? Wow. Okay, heightened backdrop of geopolitical risk. You have inflation and that bad smell lingering. Uh, Standard Charter joins us to talk us through where she sees prices going next. And actually, at this point in time, how do you play the gold story? There we go with Suki Cooper. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. Uh, we're going to get into the weeds of gold right now. You really try and figure out what's going on here. Fresh record. You have used inflation, of course, this week, although calming market nerves as far as cuts go, maybe continuing to push the price of, of, of spot gold higher even more so. Maybe as a hedge, you have March producer prices also getting slightly than expected there. Uh, you look here to date, though, don't forget that if gold is doing well, don't forget about silver, which actually has yeah. done better uh, than gold. Um, let's try and figure out what's going on. Joining us now is Suki Cooper, precious metals analyst at Standard Charter Bank. Suki, a pleasure to have you to show in quite timely. Maybe you can take us through, you know, from the plausible theories to some of the which are bordering on <laughs> fantasy. What do you think is behind this move up in gold? This gold move has been fascinating for a number of reasons. We haven't seen a new risk event. We haven't seen a new catalyst that has triggered this rally higher, which in our view makes it more prone to corrections and makes price action likely to be more choppy. Typically, when we see a move of this magnitude, it tends to be driven by either speculative positioning in the first instance and then followed through by stickier demand, whether that's 
ETS or physical demand following through and pushing gold prices higher. So this move has been interesting because we had a small window this week where we started to see ETF inflows, but that has quickly disappeared and reverted back to outflows. Instead, what we have seen is a large increase in tactical positioning. And even then, positioning isn't at all-time highs. So there's still scope for further growth if we're looking at whether positioning is overcrowded, whether it's ETS, whether it's coin demand, whether it's tactical positioning. At the moment, it isn't. But one key dynamic that has supported the complex is the fact that central banks have remained net buyers, and they have been so for more than the past year. Mm. So mm -hmm. it, what's perplexing is that we're, st we're seeing, you know, all these successive all-time highs, Suki, as you mentioned. Despite that, you know, real yields are remaining elevated. Mm -hmm. The dollar is still strong. And, and even with the markets repricing and pricing out the possibility of cuts this year, gold continues to edge higher. So do, so do those drivers, are, are they not as relevant now? Mm -hmm. what, what are going to be the key drivers to look out for? But the gold market market sentiment almost becomes even more important than some of the macro data releases we see on a week by week basis. And when sentiment is positive, we see gold's focus becoming much more fickle and it will switch to following rate cut expectations, the timing, or whether it's safe haven demand and geopolitical risks, or whether it's inflation and whether inflation remains sticky and therefore gold can act as an inflation hedge. So at the moment, given that sentiment is so positive, it's really side, um, uh, sidestepped any of these headwinds and only looked at what the positive factors are. But also, I think what is interesting in the current rally is that we're still seeing many buyers in the market, whether it's appetite in China, whether it's continued central bank buying, whether it's a tactical positioning. But we're not seeing as much selling as you normally would when you see prices at these sorts of levels. So we haven't seen a surge in recycling supply. We haven't seen some of the normal sellers or the physical market dropping off a cliff, um, even though prices are at all-time highs. Instead, volumes have come down, but we haven't seen a huge wave of selling counteracting that upward momentum. Suki, to, to pick up on what one of the things you just pointed out there, the, the demand coming out of China, what specifically are you seeing in terms of buying coming out of China? So we tend to track a number of factors, looking at retail appetite, looking at the official sector appetite, and across the sector as a whole. And what we're seeing at the moment is that the Shanghai Gold Exchange premium remains relatively elevated, suggesting that underlying demand is still healthy. In January, we had record gold imports going into China, so overall appetite remains strong. Partially, you could have said that was the buying leading up to the Lunar New Year, but it but we did see a slowdown in the immediate aftermath of the Lunar New Year, but then appetite picked up again. And even when we look at central bank official sector buying, we had the uh, March data released earlier this week, and China continued to add to their uh, overall reserves, but at a lower volume. So what we're seeing at the moment is that there's a lack of alternative investments potentially that are continuing to buoy appetite in gold. So China is the one area where we're seeing a pocket of strength, where physical demand in other um, regions such as India um, across Europe is starting to weaken. Okay, tell us about some levels that you're watching out for now, right? Because we briefly touched 2400. I think maybe a few months ago, people would have thought that was crazy. What levels are we looking at now? How much more upside really are we talking about? I think given the factor that this is not being followed through by uh, physical flows or by ETF holdings that we can track, it's very difficult to track where that upside momentum might come from. And given it's much more choppy, we think that the upside at the moment isn't being capped, but the downside is being very well supported. So we think that the floor for gold, which hasn't really been tested, is still quite well supported at these sort of levels. So at the upside, we think at the moment that there's still scope for further um, growth. We could still see tactical positioning pushing prices to even yet higher highs. Um, but it's difficult to call where that level might be just yet. Mm. And how would you recommend uh, playing gold at this point? Spot, physical, ETF, minor, whatever derivative, for example, Suki? We, 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 given that we're commodity-focused um, analysts, it's difficult to say whether gold is a better um, product than, say, some of the stocks. But what we are seeing at the moment is that 
investors are much keener at the moment to invest in tactical positioning and the ETFs are continuing to fall. So there's not as much appetite to invest in the ETFs. Coin demand has been very choppy as well. So maybe that retail demand has come off. But it does look like investors are not keen to short gold at these current levels. And there's a whole raft of factors that's buoying that appetite in gold. It's not just the expectations of rate cuts, but it's a continued uncertainty around geopolitical risks. So at the moment, there's appetite to buy gold. And at the moment, it looks like it's really coming from the tactical investor side. And what's really, you know, gold's really overshadowed what, what silver's doing, right? We were just showing those year-to-date gains. Uh, and that's actually in some ways outperformed this year when it comes to silver, Suki. I mean, obviously, we've been waiting for this catch-up to happen, but, you know, how much do you think silver should cost right now? Silver is an interesting um, precious metal because, on the one hand, it has the same drivers as the gold market. It pushes gold prices higher when we see a supportive macro backdrop, but also it has a huge industrial component. And when we look at silver from an industrial component standpoint, the outlook is very positive when we're looking at growth from um, the photovoltaic sector, when we're looking at from electrification of vehicles, 5G network rollout. There's a huge potential of growth for underlying supportive um, demand growth for the silver market. But the investor side hasn't really been keen to catch up until now. And whereas gold ETFs have been lacking, silver ETFs have really picked up. So with the silver market, we think that we could see prices um, potentially extending their gains towards $30 per ounce. But we really saw this as a target that would play out over a longer term basis and not as quickly as it has done. And Suki, just to build on that too, if you could talk us through a little bit more about your outlook for you know, industrial demand for not just silver, if you could also mention things like palladium and platinum as well, uh, if you could. Looking at the sector as a whole, we were expecting a recovery when it came to both platinum and palladium, at least in the short term. When we look at some of the end usages, I think some of the demand trends hadn't necessarily filtered through for the PGM space because stocks were as elevated as they were. And abundant stock supply across the supply chain meant that even though when we were seeing a pickup in underlying um, car sales, that wasn't necessarily translating into stronger demand for the PGM space. But now we think we're entering a, a, a period where some of those stocks have been run down and we're more likely to see a more direct impact on the downside support at least for the PGMs lifting, um, the, uh, lifting the floor higher for both platinum and palladium. So we think that there is room for growth for both platinum and palladium but we think over the longer term i.e. beyond 2024 that's when some of the supply concerns um, will start to kick in for perhaps platinum and we'll tend to see more upside risk for platinum and then whereas for palladium we think the demand will start to weaken and we're more likely to see Palladium um, surrendering its premium over the platinum market um, over the next few months. Suki Cooper, thank you so much for joining us. I know it's getting late over there. Precious Metals Analyst at Standard Chartered Bank. Just want to recap some of these lines that we're hearing here. So this press briefing with the Bank of Korea is happening uh, this morning and we're hearing a little bit more from the governor. So, so far we're hearing this rate decision was unanimous to hold rates. Five members favored a rate at three and a half percent over the next three months. So still holding for that time. One member open to a rate cut the next three months. So you're starting to see within these members, some are also looking at maybe a, a reduction mm. in, in borrowing costs pretty soon. So maybe they are leaning a little bit more towards cuts now before, the, you know, compared to the last meeting. It's certainly clearer. Yeah. Isn't it? A statement, um, the openness, not so much the vote because the vote was really just for, for this. We'll have more on this, this press briefing, in case uh, our, for our Bloomberg clients who do want to uh, keep an eye on this as we head for a short break. Uh, check it out, LIV Go, uh, on your Bloomberg terminals. And on top of this, you have all their diary entries, of course, coming up later today. So do check out that function on your screens and continue to track what's going on there at the Bank of Korea. Plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg.
So let's uh, talk about KKR. The co-CEOs of the company say China's consumer sector remains a sweet spot. That's despite the sluggish recovery, but they're actually avoiding politically sensitive sectors like AI, for example. Uh, Joe Bay and Scott Noodle uh, told us exclusively about their current focus on Asia, including this revival that's taking place in Japan. Asia for us is really an area we've been building and growing for two decades now, since 2005, and an area where we, have, as a firm, have a really, really dominant position, the largest alt manager in Asia today. So we've grown from 18 billion of AUM to 65 billion of AUM in the last five years in Asia, organically, to give you a sense of the type of growth. It's the fastest growing part of the world today. 60% of global GDP growth is coming out of Asia. The most exciting consumer trends are coming out of Asia. So it's a natural place for us to be focused as private equity, as infrastructure investors, as real estate investors. In Japan, in particular, is exciting. It's around 40% of our business in Asia is Japan. Just given it's two decades of deflation, it's coming out of this long economic morass. And the, the implications for Japan are profound in terms of where savings are going, in terms of corporate governance reform, the opportunity for us to really buy great non-core businesses from big conglomerates. So it's a very target-rich opportunity for us. Yeah, and it's not just in our asset management business. If you look at the life insurance and annuity market, in the U.S., it's a $4 trillion market. In Japan, it's $3 trillion. So it's a massive market across a lot of what we do. And so we see opportunities to expand in multiple parts of KKR in Japan. A lot of people are focused on Japan right now. Uh, KKR has a more dominant position. There's also a lot of focus on China and what to do with that. And a lot of people are saying we're getting out. Uh, uh, you do have a, a significant presence in China. How do you think about yeah. how that lives, given the geopolitics of the moment, which sure. are highly uncertain? Well, listen, our approach to China, I think, has been consistent since we started our business there. We have three offices, Beijing, Shanghai, and Hong Kong. So we are committed to that market. But the complexity of investing in China is obviously much higher today. Our focus over the last two decades has really been focused on the consumer segment of China, the growing middle class, the urbanization trends in that marketplace. And that's the sweet spot of the opportunity for us. So we've invested in uh, retail companies, branded consumer goods, healthcare. We are not leaning into these high growth areas that are geopolitically sensitive, like semiconductors, like AI. So we've avoided a lot of the areas that are currently creating a lot of turmoil in the market, and we're sticking to our knitting, consumer services. All right, that was the mm. KKR co-CEOs, Joe Bay and Scott Nuttall. They're speaking exclusively with our colleague Lisa Abramowitz in New York. All right, some breaking news continually here when we talk about this BOK decision. So the governor is now saying the board is now open to a rate cut if CPI slows in the second half. So they're saying now that the BOK had a crossroads on whether to signal that policy change but still, that second half rate outlook is still difficult, they're saying. Yeah, th that's a big if, right? Yeah. If, 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 that's not really saying a lot, if I'm being <laughs> honest. But that said, of course, that underscores the uncertainty surrounding the path of inflation because inflation in Korea actually is still hovering above the central bank's target yes. for one, which is why when you look at swap, the swaps market, uh, you're not seeing anything priced as far as rate cuts go. Let's see if that changes, though, with this comment com uh, coming through. It was interesting. Earlier in the statement, they mentioned core inflation, likely to slow to the 2% level at the end of the year. So that they have a little bit more of a framework oh, okay. of when they might hit that target. But still, unsure when U.S. policy pivot will start. So that's also a question the second half as well, whether they can actually cut before the Fed does or if they're willing to do so, hmm. or are they just waiting to follow the Fed? So, yep. I think he's, he said comments before, at least he ruled out the first half mm. of any sort of rate cuts, but maybe this is the first time we're hearing maybe what the second half might look like. Yeah, one member is open to rate cut earlier on in the next three months or so. The others might be more comfortable beyond a certain time frame. Some questions coming through as well uh, towards the back of Korea. Governor, we'll leave that there for now. Uh, we'll keep things in Korea first, though, and just pivot and look at the equity markets. And Samsung Electronics, we're down about a tenth of one percent there. Uh, that's on the back of this, boom, this report's uh, that Samsung is preparing to take the wraps off this $44 billion investment in U.S. chip makers, chip makers, and that could come as soon as next week. There we go. Mm. So we're looking at that. Any sort of reaction, and on the latter, not so much 
uh, as we speak. Apple suppliers in focus. Yeah, this is Bloomberg School from our Mark mm. Gurman talking about they're looking to overhaul the entire Mac line mm. with AI focused chips. So we, we, we're, we could be seeing some new uh, <laughs> MacBooks pretty soon. And so it seems like that's really helping and, and benefiting the supply chain here in the region. Look at Luxshare Precision, that's up close to 2% right now. And goal, as we can talk about, continuing to talk about the, the gold price here. And we, we come off a little bit, but we were at 24.10 at one point this yeah. morning. Uh, we're back below, well, just around 24. But yes, the miners still loving that. Jiaojing mining up some 6%. Still ahead on the China show, JP Morgan Asset Management coming through. Talk a little bit more about Korea is in the, the sights of Marcelo Chow. She's going to explain why. This is Bloomberg. There we go. Oh, is it raining or are the windows just need a bit of cleaning? Uh, maybe, maybe both. Maybe both. Or maybe just I need some sleep. Right? Maybe, maybe you need glasses. Looks fine to me. <laughs> okay. It's probably that. <laughs> probably that. I do need to order contact lenses, though, so do remind me to, to shoot uh, them a message. I ran out of one of the boxes. That's okay. too much information. Too much. Go. Half of 1% to the upside here on the Nikkei 225. 153 right now. And at these levels, you normally oh, 153. 153 on, on dollar, <laughs> dollar yen. Uh, not much movement there, but yeah, you know, the big move this week has certainly also been in yields, right? We were, this 10-year yield following the CPI print out of the U.S., up seven, eight basis points to where we are uh, currently. Now, what's interesting also is that while bond markets have yet to fully retrace losses, equity markets have almost gone completely back, and they've actually done quite well, with the exception of some equity markets. Yeah, I mean, mm. Hong Kong certainly is seeing, you know, getting mm. hit here mm. today, but the rest of Asia is looking a little bit better, but mm. we're really being dragged down by the Hang Seng. We're down at one and a half percent there. Asia shares are also down 1.4 percent. So, but mostly speaking, we are actually seeing some green uh, with Japan, uh, with other markets as well. So certainly we'll watch very closely what goes on. U.S. futures are flat. There's not, it's quiet, as you can see. Um, sector by sector, it's mostly red, though. There is seeing a bit of downside when it comes to the energy space here as well. But tech still catching a slight bit here, as well as healthcare, industrial still in this part of the world. Um, let's bring in Marcella Chow, our global market, or the global market strategist at J.P. Morgan Asset Management. Um, should we start with Korea, I guess? Yeah. It's interesting, just given what we're hearing from the Bank of Korea, maybe it's interesting that you know, if rate cuts are coming in the second half, why are you looking at this market so closely now? Actually, with the whole, in the past first quarter, we have seen how the AI boost continues. Mm -hmm. And actually, Korea has over 46% of this equity market fundamentally linked to the AI theme. Mm -hmm. So on that, on that sense, and with also the whole tag upswing, so on the export side, it's supportive. And um, so that is like a tag North Asia story with Taiwan, Korea, mm. but on on also the value side, we also see the value corporate uh, mm. corporate value up program, mm. which is similar, mirroring what Japan has been doing for the past ten years. Um, indeed, with the recent legislative uh, legislative election, market views us as a negative to this whole value up program, and we we'll, we are still believing that as a positive in the medium to long run. Uh, we see that as a process, not a particular event. So, um, and it should be supportive, especially as we continue to see more details, hopefully coming out um, in May, mm. where the government will um, um, announce more details on the program. So on that side, um, and most importantly, valuation is actually fair. Um, it's 11.3 times compared to 15 year average 10 times. And actually earnings growth for 2024, it's a 77% expectation, 77%, which is a great increase, great leap from around 50% a year ago. Right. And, um, and um, 2025 as well is going to be 24%. It's very uh, encouraging earnings growth um, expectations numbers. And whether you know, the, the, the market's ability to reach, let's say, 80% earnings growth, let's, let's call it 80%, mm. is hinged on the chip cycle. Do you think the chip cycle has turned? Because you mentioned almost half of this market, mm. the earnings are concentrated on one specific sector, which is chips. Yeah, indeed. And we see it as a memory cycle uh, as, as near bottom. And actually, we see that uh, inventory has been improving, etc. Okay. And so, and actually, the 10 day export number that just came out is mm. quite encouraging as well. So, all this continues to quite support uh, both, not just, it's like a dual track, so the value side and also the growth side. So 
well, the yeah. career story I think is worth looking. And it, um, admittedly, it may not be like a near term uh, six to twelve months, uh, but uh, we see that actually with this fellow program uh, and uh, its upside potential, give investors more time to build in uh, and to add more value, uh, add more into value names. So uh, maybe I'm going to step, take a step back now and look at equities in general. I mean, is, is this still an environment to get into equities, just given what we've heard this week? You know, data c continues to be very, very strong in the U.S. Mm. Um, and, and continue to see this roiling in the bond market right now. Indeed. And actually, and when we try to recap, because we just put out the second quarter guide to markets, uh, we see that surprisingly 1Q has been a very robust market, and for equities particularly. We see that in the first quarter, not just U.S., we see that Germany, uh, uh, Japan, France, and also Latin America actually all got um, a broke record for the first quarter with like uh, equity gains. And also, uh, with when I last came, I, I, I talked about how we're expecting uh, market breadth to broaden out, and it's realized. And it's not just within U.S., mm. it's across country, mm. across different sectors, and across different styles. So this is something that with a robust market and with the themes broadening out and also the market broadening out is actually quite a healthy fundamental improvement. So going forward, especially even though right now with inflation remains still sticky, mm. uh, there are still different rate cut expectations and rate cut calls, etc. But the next will still likely be a cut. So, right. and um, the backdrop is still going to be encouraging. Is, let me look at the other side uh, of that. Is this market, U.S. market in particular, uh, due for a correction? There might be some consolidation, admittedly. Mm. And um, dispersion continues to occur. And uh, with the broadening happening out, it means that there might be some consolidation going forward to broaden it out to not just those top 10, but more into those 490 uh, companies that have solid fundamentals. So uh, consolidation would definitely happen. And what we see uh, with Magnificent Seven as well, we saw the dispersion and uh, the results and dispersion and the market reaction as well. It's not no longer the Magnificent Seven as we last talked about. Yeah. Uh, there are it. ones that are no longer as encouraging, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So that, that will happen. <laughs> Happen as well with the broadening out effect across U.S. and across also different markets. Um, just this week, though, I mean, just with this strong inflation print, it, it looks like there's going to be a lot of central banks around EM, particularly in this region, that are actually going to do a lot more in preventing a slide in their currencies, just given how strong the dollar is. Uh -huh. how, how do you see that playing out? Right now, we do see lots of like verbal uh, intervention um, across from different central banks. And going forward, especially with U.S. dollar, we continue to believe in the medium to long term, U.S. dollar will weaken. But in the near term, with inflation prints and how resilient the economy is, and also potentially with the interest rate staying higher than longer, our view is a bit more neutral right now for U.S. dollar. Mm. And so this suggests that um, there might be more weakening with regards to like Asian currencies. And uh, that, that may uh, suggest that there might be even more verbal intervention that's needed mm. to protect the currency, et cetera, and prevent capital outflows. Right. So if you could elaborate on that a little bit more, do you think uh, central banks, not just the BOJ, not just the PBOC, will need to really step up beyond what we've seen beyond already, verbal, yeah. beyond verbal intervention. Are we entering a phase where the dollar strength is becoming a real problem for the economies? Right now, because um, dollar in, in, is, in, in terms of valuation is still overvalued. Mm -hmm. So we do see that it, it needs to get, uh, be corrected, etc. cetera. And um, in terms of Asian currencies, like, I think with regards to verbal intervention, I think the most key is the credibility. Mm -hmm. So uh, if it's followed through with credible actions, and market trusted it and go for it, uh, go, go, go with uh, what the central banks have been doing, then that, that will be a credible action to do and a credible uh, <laughs> reaction from the market as well. But uh, right now, I think going forward, we'll continue to see how with actually U.S. Act, uh, going forward is still going to be a rate cut. So um, it depends on how much um, cut is going to happen. And going forward, we're still um, fundamentally, we are seeing still some sort of volatility with geopolitical risks rising, etc. So in the medium to long run, we'll still see some uh, with overvalue in the U.S. dollar. We'll still see um, it coming down a bit. But near term, it might still be quite neutral on that. Right. On fixed income, it's been an eventful week. Yields have been pushing higher. And you know, I'm wondering... 
should should investors abandon duration at this point? Should we just stick to the short end of the curve? Should we should we stay away from fixed income at this point? What's the what are your uh, advice? What's your prescriptive? And then we here? continue to um, advise investors to monitor the duration, um, given how at the beginning we uh, suggest advocating like to increase duration, given how. Uh, um, interest rates might be coming down earlier than expected, but right now the call has changed a bit, and so. Um, but I think right now, the, um, what investors are questioning is with the tight spreads, uh, is it going to go even tighter? We we believe right now the spreads, uh, there are limited potential for it to go even tighter, but it will likely stay tight. Okay. And compared to past um, episodes when it is this tight, um, actually even with IG and high yield, it actually continues to clock decent analyzed total return. For IG, we see around 3%, high yield around 4%. And uh, in the first quarter, we've seen actually a uh, very decent return in IG. Um, um, we got actually around 7.7% from IG over the past two quarters. Mm -hmm. And with high yield, we actually got 9.1%. Okay. And with average yields of around 5.6% uh, for IG and also 8.4% for high yield. So going forward, we expect uh, yields to stabilize, but uh, spreads might still remain tight given how Corporate fundamentals remain really sound. Okay, yeah. Uh, have a good weekend. <laughs> thank you. Marcella, thank you so much. Marcella Chow, uh, global market strategist at JP Morgan Asset Management. Uh, there is uh, plenty more ahead here on the China Show. Now to the battle for global supremacy in chip making. The U.S. took a crucial early role in developing the technology that underpins today's AI revolution. But a Dutch firm now holds a monopoly on the process while Asian manufacturers dominate production. Bloomberg Originals has been looking at how the U.S. dropped the ball. This is arguably the single most important machine in the world right now, technologically, economically and geopolitically. Without it, the global economy would slow, the pace of technological advancement would stutter. They cost $200 million each, and of the 200 or so that exist today, just a handful are on U.S. soil. What's more, successive U.S. administrations have had to scramble to ensure that none are sold into China. And that's despite the fact that much of the early work on the technology originated in the U.S. This is a story about where physics meets business and has a massive impact on the world's economy. So how did the United States manage to miss out on this colossally important piece of tech? It's called an extreme ultraviolet lithography, or EUV machine, and it produces the world's most advanced semiconductors. EUV technology is the only reason that we have iPhones that are as fast as they are, the reason that we have this AI revolution with chatbots and ChatGPT. The device has turned the only company that produces it, the Dutch firm ASML, into Europe's biggest technology firm. Lithography is how circuit patterns are engraved onto chips. This is a very, very important part of the process of making semiconductors. The scale of extreme ultraviolet lithography machines is mind-boggling. Each device is the size of a bus, but is designed to etch patterns onto chips that are billionths of a meter across. How they do so is a remarkable feat of engineering. A high-powered laser is fired at a tiny target of tin droplets about 50,000 times a second. That creates a plasma that emits extreme ultraviolet light, which has a wavelength of 13 and a half nanometers. This light doesn't occur naturally on Earth. In fact, it's absorbed by most materials, including air. So the whole process is conducted in a vacuum, and a series of mirrors reflect and focus the EUV light. Each mirror is coated in layers of molybdenum and silicon, and polished to a smoothness of less than one atom's thickness. That's important because any blemish reduces the quality of the chips being produced. Midway through this process, the EUV light is reflected by a reticle that contains the pattern of the circuits that are to be etched onto the chip. These are then reflected and focused even more to make the pattern even tinier before hitting the silicon wafer. Each wafer is etched with billions of such patterns. The problem was it's so difficult to do. The semiconductor industry is always racing to make things smaller, and its ability to keep doing that helps the global economy keep growing. 
now some of the layers of materials that go into making semiconductors are one atom thick. You don't get thinner than one atom. Semiconductors eventually faced a problem where they were really getting to the limits of the physics. In the 1980s, scientists started to think that EUV light might be the best way to get to that atomic level. The US government, through what are called the National Labs, has always been helpful to the semiconductor industry at sort of underwriting some of these fundamental advances. In fact, the Department of Energy ended up putting tens of millions of dollars into EUV research at three labs across the US. To make the jump from research to reality, an alliance was formed with companies including Intel, AMD, and Motorola. They'd match any government spending. In 1999, a little-known Dutch lithography company called ASML joined too. Remember that in the 1990s, the Japanese were a major threat to US dominance of the chip industry. The US government threw its weight behind ASML over the Japanese companies who were really leading in photolithography at the time. ASML went all in. They reckoned the tech could be ready commercially by 2006. EV technology is really a moonshot. It was incredibly expensive and incredibly complicated. By 2012, progress had been made, but more was needed. It looked like EUV actually might be possible, but ASML actually needed lots of investment. So they turned to their customers. TSMC, Samsung and Intel decided, wow, this stuff is really important. We better put some billions of dollars behind it to make sure it actually happens. And Intel was the biggest contributor to that. It was really thanks to ASML's stubbornness that they took years and billions in funding to actually produce EUV technology as we know it now. Finally, in 2017, ASML begins shipping the machines in meaningful numbers. But despite the billions of dollars of investment from American companies like Intel and the US government, the first generation of devices all went to TSMC and Samsung. And it wasn't because ASML didn't want to sell machines to Intel. Intel thought that EUV was really important, but like its competitors, they saw the issues with it. That was a decision that they made, and it's a decision that cost them massively. Essentially, the then CEO, Brian Krasanich, didn't think Intel could make EUV work profitably and would be fine without it. Intel was the biggest company in town in the industry, dominated the industry for multiple decades. Everybody else was playing catch up. This is the scale at which Intel and TSMC have been able to make chips. Both have consistently got smaller, but with Intel leading the size reduction. Until 2018, when TSMC overtook Intel for the first time. The reason was, at its core, pretty simple. TSMC was making chips with EUV machines, and Intel wasn't. Soon after, Samsung's Galaxy Note 10 smartphone hits the market, the first consumer device featuring chips made with the EUV process. Apple follows, but then there's a problem. Huawei, which was the world's largest smartphone maker at one point, was buying chips from TSMC. The fact that Chinese device makers were making some of the most advanced smartphones caught the attention of the American government. Huawei is something that's very dangerous. You look at what they've done from a security standpoint, from a military standpoint, it's very dangerous. One of the ironies of EUV is that a lot of the underlying technology originated in the United States, but the direct and indirect beneficiaries of that technology haven't really been concentrated in the US. You had a company in mainland China buying chips from a company in Taiwan using equipment made in the Netherlands. This vital cog in the wheel was made by a company in another country, one that they couldn't directly control. So it took a lot of work by Washington to persuade the Dutch not to allow ASML to export EUV to China. The details of how ASML did not ship to China have really been a little bit obscure. All we know is that they state vehemently over and over again, we have never shipped EUV to China. In 2012, Intel was 15 times bigger than NVIDIA and almost twice as big as TSMC. That's when it first invested in ASML. But Intel's failure to move early on EUV has allowed a number of rivals to overtake it. Intel's growth has stalled as TSMC, and especially NVIDIA, have boomed. Intel's leadership team under Krasanich really gave away the keys to the kingdom and that caused a knock-on effect inside Intel. Krasanich left, some of the other leadership was replaced and there was kind of a scramble to get that company back online and one of the conclusions that new leadership came to was we need EUV. We have a very strong partnership with ASML and our plans to now stay on the leading edge of EUV usage are well underway. That's Pat Gelsinger, Intel's current CEO. He's throwing the company's weight behind the next technology. 
The new new thing in the world of EUV is called High Numerical Aperture or High NA EUV. To give you an idea of how important this is, Intel has been loudly touting to anybody who'll listen, they've got the first High NA machine. There's a lot at stake. The US's leadership in semiconductors and the success of President Joe Biden's CHIPS Act, which has set aside $100 billion in subsidies for the semiconductor industry. We will enable advanced semiconductor manufacturing to make a comeback here in America after 40 years. Politicians have finally woken up to how important semiconductors truly are. And Intel's entire plan to turn the company around is predicated on the idea that they can actually get government funding to build semiconductor plants and become a leader again in semiconductor technology. There we go. Bloomberg subscribers, of course, can check out that original documentary again anytime on the terminal, also Bloomberg.com. It's also up on YouTube later Friday. Fantastic work, of course, from that team. Plenty more ahead. This is Bloomberg.